Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, recorded by Mill Nicholson. Chapter Thirty relates what Oliver's new visitors thought of him. With many loquacious assurances that they would be agreeably surprised in the aspect of the criminal, the doctor drew the young lady's arm through one of his, and offering his disengaged hand to Mrs. Maylie, led them with much ceremony and stateliness upstairs. Now, said the doctor, in a whisper, as he softly turned the handle of the bedroom door, let us hear what you think of him. He has not been shaved very recently, but he don't look at all ferocious, notwithstanding. Stop, though. Let me first see that he is in visiting order. Stepping before them, he looked into the room. Motioning them to advance, he closed the door when they had entered, and gently drew back the curtains of the bed. Upon it, in lieu of the dogged, black-visaged ruffian they had expected to behold, there lay a mere child, worn with pain and exhaustion, and sunk into a deep sleep. His wounded arm, bound and splintered up, was crossed upon his breast. His head reclined upon the other arm, which was half hidden by his long hair, as it streamed over the pillow. The honest gentleman held the curtain in his hand, and looked on, for a minute or so, in silence. Whilst he was watching the patient thus, the young lady glided softly past, and seating herself in a chair by the bedside, gathered Oliver's hair from his face. As she stooped over him, her tears fell upon his forehead. The boy stirred and smiled in his sleep, as though these marks of pity and compassion had awakened some pleasant dream of a love and affection he had never known. Thus a strain of gentle music, or the rippling of water in a silent place, or the odour of a flower, or the mention of a familiar word, will sometimes call up sudden dim remembrances of scenes that never were in this life, which vanish like a breath which some brief memory of a happier existence, long gone by, would seem to have awakened, which no voluntary exertion of the mind can ever recall. "'What can this mean?' exclaimed the elder lady. "'This poor child can never have been the pupil of robbers.' "'Vice,' said the surgeon, replacing the curtain, "'takes up her abode in many temples, and who can say that a fair outside shall not enshrine her?' "'But at so early an age,' urged Rose. "'My dear young lady,' rejoined the surgeon mournfully, shaking his head, "'crime, like death, is not confined to the old and withered alone. The youngest and fairest are too often its chosen victims.' "'But can you—oh, can you really believe that this delicate boy has been the voluntary associate of the worst outcasts of society?' said Rose. The surgeon shook his head, in a manner which intimated that he feared it was very possible, and observing that they might disturb the patient, led the way into an adjoining apartment. "'But even if he has been wicked,' pursued Rose, "'think how young he is. Think that he may never have known a mother's love, or the comfort of a home, that ill-usage and blows, or the want of bread, may have driven him to herd with men who have forced him to guilt. Aunt, dear aunt, for mercy's sake, think of this, before you let them drag this sick child to a prison, which in any case must be the grave of all his chances of amendment. Oh, as you love me, and know that I have never felt the want of parents in your goodness and affection, but that I might have done so, and might have been equally helpless and unprotected with this poor child, have pity upon him before it is too late." "'My dear love,' said the elderly lady, as she folded the weeping girl to her bosom, "'do you think I would harm a hair of his head?' "'Oh, no,' replied Rose eagerly. "'No, surely,' said the old lady. "'My days are drawing to their close, and may mercy be shown to me as I show it to others. What can I do to save him, sir?' "'Let me think, ma'am said the doctor. Let me think. Mr. Losburn thrust his hands into his pockets, and took several turns up and down the room, often stopping and balancing himself on his toes, and frowning frightfully. After various exclamations of, I've got it now, and, no, I haven't, and as many renewals of the walking and frowning, he at length made a dead halt, 
and spoke as follows. "'I think, if you give me a full and unlimited commission to bully Giles, and that little boy Brittles, I can manage it. Giles is a faithful fellow, and an old servant, I know, but you can make it up to him in a thousand ways, and reward him for being such a good shot besides. You don't object to that?' "'Unless there is some other way of preserving the child,' replied Mrs. Maylie. "'There is no other,' said the doctor. "'No other. Take my word for it.' "'Then my aunt invests you with full power,' said Rose, smiling through her tears. "'But pray, don't be harder upon the poor fellows than is indispensably necessary.' "'You seem to think,' retorted the doctor, "'that everybody is disposed to be hard-hearted to-day except yourself, Miss Rose. I only hope, for the sake of the rising male sex generally, that you may be found in as vulnerable and soft-hearted a mood by the first eligible young fellow who appeals to your compassion. And I wish I were a young fellow, that I might avail myself on the spot of such a favourable opportunity for doing so as the present." "'You are as great a boy as poor Brittles himself,' returned Rose, blushing. "'Well,' said the doctor, laughing heartily, that is no very difficult matter. But to return to this boy. The great point of our agreement is yet to come. He will wake in an hour or so, I dare say. And although I have told that thick-headed constable fellow downstairs that he mustn't be moved or spoken to, on peril of his life, I think we may converse with him without danger. Now I make this stipulation, that I shall examine him in your presence, and that, if from what he says, we judge, and I can show to the satisfaction of your cool reason that he is a real and thorough bad one, which is more than possible, he shall be left to his fate, without any farther interference on my part, at all events." "'Oh, no, aunt!' entreated Rose. "'Oh, yes, aunt,' said the doctor. "'Is it a bargain?' "'He cannot be hardened in vice,' said Rose. "'It is impossible.' "'Very good,' retorted the doctor. Then so much the more reason for acceding to my proposition." Finally the treaty was entered into, and the parties thereunto sat down to wait, with some impatience, until Oliver should awake. The patience of the two ladies was destined to undergo a longer trial than Mr. Losburn had led them to expect, for hour after hour passed on, and still Oliver slumbered heavily. It was evening, indeed before the kind-hearted doctor brought them the intelligence that he was at length sufficiently restored to be spoken to. The boy was very ill, he said, and weak from the loss of blood, but his mind was so troubled with anxiety to disclose something that he deemed it better to give him the opportunity than to insist upon his remaining quiet until next morning, which he should otherwise have done. The conference was a long one. Oliver told them all his simple history and was often compelled to stop by pain and want of strength. It was a solemn thing to hear, in the darkened room, the feeble voice of the sick child, recounting a weary catalogue of evils and calamities which hard men had brought upon him. Oh, if when we oppress and grind our fellow-creatures we bestowed but one thought on the dark evidences of human error, which, like dense and heavy clouds, are rising slowly, it is true, but not less surely, to heaven, to pour their after-vengeance on our heads. If we heard at one instant, in imagination, the deep testimony of dead men's voices, which no power can stifle, and no pride shut out, where would be the injury and injustice, the suffering, misery, cruelty, and wrong, that each day's life brings with it? Oliver's pillow was smoothed by gentle hands that night, and loveliness and virtue watched him as he slept. He felt calm and happy and could have died without a murmur. The momentous interview was no sooner concluded, and Oliver composed to rest again, than the doctor, after wiping his eyes, and condemning them for being weak all at once, betook himself downstairs to open upon Mr. Giles. And finding nobody about the parlours, it occurred to him that he could perhaps originate the proceedings with better effect in the kitchen. So into the kitchen he went. There were assembled, in that lower house of the domestic parliament, the women-servants, Mr. Brittles, Mr. Giles, the tinker, who had received a special invitation to regale himself for the remainder of the day, in consideration of his services, and the constable. The latter gentleman had a large staff, 
a large head, large features, and large half-boots, and he looked as if he had been taking a proportionate allowance of ale, as indeed he had. The adventures of the previous night were still under discussion, for Mr. Giles was expatiating upon his presence of mind when the doctor entered. Mr. Brittles, with a mug of ale in his hand, was corroborating everything before his superior said it. "'Sit still,' said the doctor, waving his hand. "'Thank you, sir,' said Mr. Giles. "'Mrs. wished some ale to be given out, sir, and as I felt no ways inclined for my own little room, sir, and was disposed for company, I am taking mine among him here.' Brittles headed a low murmur by which the ladies and gentlemen generally were understood to express the gratification they derived from Mr. Giles's condescension. Mr. Giles looked round with a patronising air, as much as to say that so long as they behaved properly, he would never desert them. "'How is the patient to-night, sir?' asked Giles. "'So-so,' returned the doctor. "'I am afraid. You have got yourself into a scrape there, Mr. Giles.' "'I hope you don't mean to say, sir.' said Mr. Giles, trembling, that he's going to die. If I thought it, I should never be happy again. I, I wouldn't cut a boy off. No, not even Brittles here. Not for all the plate in the county, sir. That's not the point, said the doctor mysteriously. Mr. Giles, are you a Protestant? Y yes, sir. I, I hope so, faltered Mr. Giles, who had turned very pale. And what are you, boy? said the doctor, turning sharply upon Brittles. "'Law, uh, bless me, sir,' replied Brittles, starting violently. "'I'm the same as Mr. Giles, sir.' "'Then tell me this,' said the doctor. "'Both of you, both of you, are you going to take upon yourselves to swear that that boy upstairs is the boy that was put through the little window last night? Out with it. Come, we are prepared for you.' The doctor, who was universally considered one of the best-tempered creatures on earth, made this demand in such a dreadful tone of anger, that Giles and Brittles, who were considerably muddled by ale and excitement, stared at each other in a state of stupefaction. "'Pay attention to the reply, constable, will you?' said the doctor, shaking his forefinger with great solemnity of manner, and tapping the bridge of his nose with it, to bespeak the exercise of that worthy's utmost acuteness. "'Something may come of this before long.' The constable looked as wise as he could, and took up his staff of office, which had been reclining indolently in the chimney-corner. "'It's a simple question of identity, you will observe,' said the doctor. "'That's <coughs> what, what it is, sir,' replied the constable, coughing with great violence, for he had finished his ale in a hurry, and some of it had gone the wrong way. "'Here's the house broken into,' said the doctor, "'and a couple of men—' catch one moment's glimpse of a boy, in the midst of gunpowder, smoke, and in all the distraction of alarm and darkness. Here's a boy come to that very same house next morning, and because he happens to have his arm tied up, these men lay violent hands upon him, by doing which they place his life in great danger, and swear he is the thief. Now, the question is, whether these men are justified by the fact? If not, in what situation do they place themselves? The constable nodded profoundly. He said, if that wasn't the law, he would be glad to know what was. "'I ask you again,' thundered the doctor, "'are you, on your solemn oaths, able to identify that boy?' Brittles looked doubtfully at Mr. Giles. Mr. Giles looked doubtfully at Brittles. The constable put his hand behind his ear to catch the reply. The two women and the tinker leaned forward to listen. The doctor glanced keenly round when a ring was heard at the gate, and at the same moment the sound of wheels. "'It's the runners!' cried Brittles, to all appearance much relieved. "'The what?' exclaimed the doctor, aghast in his turn. "'The Bow Street officers, sir,' replied Brittles, taking up a candle. "'Me and Mr. Giles sent for him this morning.' "'What?' cried the doctor. "'Yes,' replied Brittles. "'I sent a message up by the coachman, and I only wonder they weren't here before, sir.' "'You did, did you? Then confound your slow coaches down here. That's all,' said the doctor, walking away. CHAPTER Thirty One, INVOLVES A CRITICAL POSITION "'Who's that?' inquired Brittles, opening the door a little way, 
with the chain up, and peeping out, shading the candle with his hand. "'Open the door,' replied a man outside. "'It's the officers from Bow Street. I was sent to to to-day.' Much comforted by this assurance, Brittles opened the door to its full width, and confronted a portly man in a greatcoat, who walked in, without saying anything more, and wiped his shoes on the mat, as coolly as if he lived there. "'Just send somebody out to relieve my mate, will you, young man?' said the officer. "'He's in the gig, a minding the prad. Have you got a coach us here, that you could put it up in for five or ten minutes?' Brittles replying in the affirmative, and pointing out to the building, the portly man stepped back to the garden gate, and helped his companion to put up the gig, while Brittles lighted them in a state of great admiration. This done, they returned to the house, and, being shown into a parlour, took off their great coats and hats, and showed like what they were. The man who had knocked at the door was a stout personage of middle height, aged about fifty, with shiny black hair, cropped pretty close, half-whiskers, a round face, and sharp eyes. The other was a red-headed, bony man, in top-boots, with a rather ill-favoured countenance, and a turned-up sinister-looking nose. "'Tell your governor that Blathers and Duff is here, will you?' said the stouter man, smoothing down his hair, and laying a pair of handcuffs on the table. "'Oh! Good evening, master. Can I have a word or two with you in private, if you please?' This was addressed to Mr. Losburn, who now made his appearance. That gentleman, motioning Brittles to retire, brought in the two ladies, and shut the door. "'This is the lady of the house,' said Mr. Losburn, motioning towards Mrs. Maylie. Mr. Blathers made a bow. Being desired to sit down, he put his hat on the floor, and, taking a chair, motioned to Duff to do the same. The latter gentleman, who did not appear quite so much accustomed to good society, or quite so much at his ease in it, one of the two, seated himself, after undergoing several muscular affections of the limbs, and the head of his stick into his mouth, with some embarrassment. "'Now, with regard to this here robbery, master,' said Blathers, "'what are the circumstances?' Mr. Losburn, who appeared desirous of gaining time, recounted them at great length, and with much circumlocution. Messrs. Blathers and Duff looked very knowing, meanwhile, and occasionally exchanged a nod. "'I can't say for certain till I see the work, of course,' said Blathers, "'but my opinion at once is—I don't mind committing myself to that extent—that this wasn't done by a yokel, eh, Duff?' "'Certainly not,' replied Duff. "'And translating the word yokel for the benefits of the ladies, I apprehend your meaning to be that this attempt was not made by a countryman.' said Mr. Losburn, with a smile. "'That's it, master,' replied Blathers. "'This is all about the robbery, is it?' "'All,' replied the doctor. "'Now, what is this about this here boy that the servants are a-talking on?' said Blathers. "'Nothing at all,' replied the doctor. "'One of the frightened servants chose to take it into his head that he had something to do with this attempt to break into the house. But it's nonsense. Sheer absurdity.' "'Were he easy disposed of, if it is?' remarked Duff. "'What he says is quite correct,' observed Blathers, nodding his head in a confirmatory way, and playing carelessly with the handcuffs, as if they were a pair of castanets. "'Who is the boy? What account does he give of himself? Where did he come from? He didn't drop out of the clouds, did he, master?' "'Of course not,' replied the doctor, with a nervous glance at the two ladies. I know his whole history, but we can talk about that presently. You would like, first, to see the place where the thieves made their attempt, I suppose?" "'Certainly,' rejoined Mr. Blathers. "'We had better inspect the premises first, and examine the servants afterwards. That's the usual way of doing business.' Lights were then procured, and Messrs. Blathers and Duff, attended by the native constable, Brittles, Giles, and everybody else, in short, went into the little room at the end of the passage, and looked out at the window, and afterwards went round by way of the lawn, and looked in at the window, and after that had a candle handed out to inspect the shutter with, and after that a lantern to trace the footsteps with, 
and after that a pitchfork to poke the bushes with. This done, amidst the breathless interest of all beholders, they came in again, and Mr. Giles and Brittles were put through a melodramatic representation of their share in the previous night's adventures, which they performed some six times over, contradicting each other in not more than one important respect the first time, and in not more than a dozen the last. This consummation being arrived at, Blathers and Duff cleared the room, and held a long council together, compared with which, for secrecy and solemnity, a consultation of great doctors on the knottiest point in medicine would be mere child's play. Meanwhile the doctor walked up and down the next room, in a very uneasy state, and Mrs. Maylie and Rose looked on with anxious faces. "'Upon my word,' he said, making a halt, after a great number of very rapid turns, "'I hardly know what to do.' "'Surely,' said Rose, "'the poor child's story, faithfully repeated to these men, will be sufficient to exonerate him.' "'I doubt it, my dear young lady,' said the doctor, shaking his head. "'I don't think it would exonerate him, either with them, or with legal functionaries of a higher grade. What is he, after all, they would say? A runaway. Judged by mere worldly considerations and probabilities, his story is a very doubtful one.' "'You believe it, surely?' interrupted Rose. "'I believe it, strange as it is. And perhaps I may be an old fool for doing so,' rejoined the doctor. "'But I don't think it is exactly the tale for a practical police officer, nevertheless.' "'Why not?' demanded Rose. "'Because, my pretty cross-examiner,' replied the doctor, "'because, viewed with their eyes, there are many ugly points about it. He can only prove the parts that look ill, and none of those that look well. Confound the fellows! They will have the why and the wherefore, and will take nothing for granted. On his own showing, you see, he has been the companion of thieves for some time past. He has been carried to a police officer, on a charge of picking a gentleman's pocket. He has been taken away forcibly from that gentleman's house, to a place which he cannot describe or point out, and of the situation of which he has not the remotest idea. He is brought down to Chertsey, by men who seem to have taken a violent fancy to him, whether he will or no, and is put through a window to rob a house. And then, just at the very moment when he is going to alarm the inmates, and so do the very thing that would set him all to rights, there rushes into the way a blundering dog of a half-bred butler, and shoots him, as if on purpose to prevent his doing any good for himself. Don't you see all this?" "'I see it, of course.' replied Rose, smiling at the doctor's impetuosity. But still I do not see anything in it to criminate the poor child." "'No,' replied the doctor, "'of course not. Bless the bright eyes of your sex. They never see, whether for good or bad, more than one side of any question, and that is always the one which first presents itself to them." Having given vent to this result of experience, the doctor put his hands into his pockets, and walked up and down the room with even greater rapidity than before. "'The more I think of it,' said the doctor, "'the more I see that it will occasion endless trouble and difficulty if we put these men in possession of the boy's real story. I am certain it will not be believed, and even if they can do nothing to him in the end, still the dragging it forward and giving publicity to all the doubts that will be cast upon it must interfere materially with your benevolent plan of rescuing him from misery." "'Oh! What is to be done?' cried Rose. "'Dear, dear! Why did they send for these people?' "'Why, indeed!' exclaimed Mrs. Maylie. "'I would not have had them here for the world.' "'All I know is,' said Mr. Losburn, at last, sitting down with a kind of desperate calmness, that we must try and carry it off with a bold face. The object is a good one, and that must be our excuse. The boy has strong symptoms of fever upon him, and is in no condition to be talked to any more. That's one comfort. We must make the best of it, and if bad be the best, it is no fault of ours. Come in." "'Well, master,' said Blathers, entering the room followed by his colleague, and making the door fast, before he said any more. "'This warn't a put-up thing.' "'And what the devil's a put-up thing?' demanded the doctor impatiently. "'We call it a put-up robbery, ladies,' 
said Blathers, turning to them, as if he pitied their ignorance, but had a contempt for the doctors, when the servants is in it. "'Nobody suspected them in this case,' said Mrs. Maylie. "'Very likely not, ma'am,' replied Blathers. "'But they might have been in it, for all that.' "'More likely on that wery account,' said Duff. "'We find it was a town and said Blathers, continuing his report, "'for the style of work is first-rate.' "'Wery pretty indeed it is,' remarked Duff, in an undertone. "'There was two of em in it continued Blathers, and they had a boy with him. That's plain from the size of the window. That's all to be said at present. We'll see this lad that you've got upstairs at once, if you please. Perhaps they will take something to drink first, Mrs. Maylie," said the doctor, his face brightening as if some new thought had occurred to him. "'Oh, to be sure!' exclaimed Rose eagerly. "'You shall have it immediately, if you will.' "'Why, thank you, miss.' said Blathers, drawing his coat-sleeve across his mouth. "'It's dry work, this sort of duty. Anything that's handy, miss, don't put yourself out of the way on our accounts.' "'What shall it be?' asked the doctor, following the young lady to the sideboard. "'A little drop of spirits, master, if it's all the same,' replied Blathers. "'It's a cold ride from London, ma'am, and I always find the spirits comes home warmer to the feelings.' This interesting communication was addressed to Mrs. Maylie, who received it very graciously. While it was being conveyed to her, the doctor slipped out of the room. "'Ah!' said Mr. Blathers, not holding his wine-glass by the stem, but grasping the bottom between the thumb and forefinger of his left hand, and placing it in front of his chest. "'I have seen a good many pieces of business like this in my time, ladies.' "'That crack down in the back lane at Edmonton, Blathers,' said Mr. Duff, assisting his colleague's memory. "'That was something in this way, warn't it?' rejoined Mr. Blathers. "'That was done by Conky Chickweed, that was.' "'You always gave that to him,' replied Duff. "'It was the family pet, I told you. Conky hadn't any more to do with it than I had.' "'Get out,' retorted Mr. Blathers. "'I know better.' "'Do you mind that time?' when Conky was robbed of his money, though. What a start that was! <laughs> Better than any novel book I ever see." "'What was that?' inquired Rose, anxious to encourage any symptoms of good humour in the unwelcome visitors. "'It was a robbery, miss, that hardly anybody would have been down upon,' said Blathers. "'This here Conky chickweed. Conky means nosy, ma'am,' interposed Duff. "'Of course the lady knows that, don't she?' demanded Mr. Blathers. "'Always interrupting you are, partner. "'This here conky chickweed, miss, kept a public house over Battlebridge Way, "'and he had a cellar, where a good many young lords went to see cock-fighting "'and badger-drawing and that, and a very intellectual manner the sports was conducted in, "'for I seen him often. "'He warn't one of the family at that time, and one night, he was robbed of three hundred and twenty-seven guineas in a canvas bag that was stole out of his bedroom in the dead of night, by a tall man with a black patch over his eye, who had concealed himself under the bed, and after committing the robbery, jumped slap out of the window, which was only a story I. He was very quick about it, but Conky was quick too, for he fired a blunderbuss at him, and roused the neighbourhood. They set up a you and cry directly and when they came to look about em found that conky had hit the robber for there was traces of blood all the way to some palings a good distance off and there they lost em however he made off with the blunt and consequently the name of mr chickweed licensed whittler appeared in the gazette among the other bankrupts and all manner of benefits and subscriptions and i don't know what all was got up for the poor man who was in a very low state of mind about his loss and went up and down the streets for three or four days, a pulling his hair off in such a desperate manner that many people was afraid he might be going to make away with himself. One day he came up to the office, all in a hurry, and had a private interview with the magistrate, who, after a deal of talk, rings the bell, and orders Jem Spires in Jem was an active officer, and tells him to go and assist Mr. Chickweed 
in apprehending the man as robbed his house. "'I see him, Spires,' said Chickweed, "'pass my house yesterday morning. "'Why didn't you up and collar him?' says Spires. "'I was so struck all of a heap "'that you might have fractured my skull with a toothpick,' says the poor man. "'But we're sure to have him, for between ten and eleven o'clock at night "'he passed again.' Spires no sooner heard this than he put some clean linen and a comb in his pocket in case he should have to stop a day or two, and away he goes, and sets himself down at one of the public-house windows behind the little red curtain, with his hat on, all ready to bolt out at a moment's notice. He was smoking his pipe here, late at night, when all of a sudden Chickweed roars out, "'Here he is! Stop, thief! Murder!' Jem Spires dashes out and there he sees Chickweed a-tearing down the street full cry. Away goes Spires, on goes Chickweed, round turns the people, everybody roars out thieves, and Chickweed himself keeps on shouting all the time like mad. Spires loses sight of him a minute as he turns a corner, shoots round, sees a little crowd, dives in. Which is the man? Damn me, says Chickweed, I've lost him again. It was a remarkable occurrence, but he warn't to be seen nowhere. So they went back to the public-house. Next morning, Spires took his old place, and looked out, from behind the curtain, for a tall man with a black patch over his eye, till his own two eyes ached again. At last, he couldn't help shutting him, to ease him a minute, and from the very moment he did so, he hears Chickweed a-roaring out, "'Here he is!' Off he starts once more, with Chickweed halfway down the street ahead of him, and after twice as long a run as the yesterday's one, the man's lost again. This was done once or twice more, till one half the neighbours gave out that Mr. Chickweed had been robbed by the devil, who was playing tricks with him afterwards, and the other half, a poor Mr. Chickweed, had gone mad with grief. "'What did Jem Spires say?' inquired the doctor who had returned to the room shortly after the commencement of the story. "'Jem Spires,' resumed the officer, "'for a long time said nothing at all, and listened to everything without seeming to, which showed he understood his business. But, one morning, he walked into the bar, and taking out his snuff-box, says, "'Chickweed, I found out who done this here robbery.' "'Have you?' said Chickweed. Oh, my dear Spires, only let me have vengeance, and I shall die contented. Oh, my dear Spires, where is this villain? Come, said Spires, offering him a pinch of snuff. None of that gammon. You did it yourself. So he had, and a good bit of money he had made by it, too, and nobody would never have found it out if he hadn't been so precious anxious to keep up appearances, said Mr. Blathers putting down his wine-glass, and clinking the handcuffs together. "'Very curious, indeed,' observed the doctor. "'Now, if you please, you can walk upstairs.' "'If you please, sir,' returned Mr. Blathers. Closely following Mr. Losburn, the two officers ascended to Oliver's bedroom, Mr. Giles preceding the party with a lighted candle. Oliver had been dozing, but looked worse, and was more feverish than he had appeared yet. Being assisted by the doctor, he managed to sit up in bed for a minute or so, and looked at the strangers without at all understanding what was going forward, in fact, without seeming to recollect where he was, or what had been passing. "'This,' said Mr. Losburn, speaking softly, but with great vehemence, notwithstanding, "'this is the lad who, being accidentally wounded by a spring-gun in some boyish trespass on Mr. what you call him's ground at the back here, comes to the house for assistance this morning, and is immediately laid hold of and maltreated by that ingenious gentleman with the candle in his hand, who has placed his life in considerable danger, as I can professionally certify." Messrs. Blathers and Duff looked at Mr. Giles, as he was thus recommended to their notice. The bewildered butler gazed from them towards Oliver, and from Oliver towards Mr. Losburn, with a most ludicrous mixture of fear and perplexity. "'You don't mean to deny that, I suppose?' said the doctor, laying Oliver gently down again. 
"'It was all done for the, for the best, sir,' answered Giles. "'I am sure I thought it was the boy, or I, I wouldn't have meddled with him. I am not of an inhuman disposition, sir.' "'Thought it was what boy?' inquired the senior officer. "'The housebreaker's boy, sir,' replied Giles. "'They—they they certainly had a boy.' "'Well, do you think so now?' inquired Blathers. "'Think what now?' replied Giles, looking vacantly at his questioner. "'Think it's the same boy, stupid Ed,' rejoined Blathers impatiently. "'I don't know. I really don't know," said Giles, with a rueful countenance. "'I couldn't swear to him.' "'What do you think?' asked Mr. Blathers. "'I—I I don't know what to think,' replied poor Giles. "'I don't think it is the boy. I, indeed, I, I'm almost certain that it isn't. Y you know, it can't be.' "'Has this man been a-drinking, sir?' inquired Blathers, turning to the doctor. "'What a precious muddle-headed chap you are!' said Duff, addressing Mr. Giles with supreme contempt. Mr. Losburn had been feeling the patient's pulse during this short dialogue, but he now rose from the chair by the bedside, and remarked that if the officers had any doubts upon the subject, they would perhaps like to step into the next room and have brittles before them. Acting upon this suggestion, they adjourned to a neighbouring apartment, where Mr. Brittles, being called in, involved himself and his respected superior in such a wonderful maze of fresh contradictions and impossibilities as tended to throw no particular light on anything but the fact of his own strong mystification except indeed his declarations that he shouldn't know the real boy if he were put before him in that instant that he had only taken oliver to be he because mr giles had said he was and that mr giles had five minutes previously admitted in the kitchen that he began to be very much afraid he had been a little too hasty. Among other ingenious surmises, the question was then raised whether Mr. Giles had really hit anybody, and upon examination of the fellow pistol to that which he had fired, it turned out to have no more destructive loading than gunpowder and brown paper, a discovery which made a considerable impression on everybody but the doctor, who had drawn the ball about ten minutes before. Upon no one, however, did it make a greater impression than on Mr. Giles himself, who, after labouring for some hours under the fear of having mortally wounded a fellow-creature, eagerly caught at this new idea, and favoured it to the utmost. Finally, the officers, without troubling themselves very much about Oliver, left the Chertsey constable in the house, and took up their rest for that night in the town, promising to return the next morning. With the next morning there came a rumour that two men and a boy were in the cage at Kingston, who had been apprehended overnight under suspicious circumstances, and to Kingston Messrs. Blathers and Duff journeyed accordingly. The suspicious circumstances, however, resolving themselves on investigation into the one fact that they had been discovered sleeping under a haystack, which, although a great crime, is only punishable by imprisonment, and is in the merciful eye of the English law and its comprehensive love of all the King's subjects, held to be no satisfactory proof, in the absence of all other evidence, that the sleeper, or sleepers, have committed burglary accompanied with violence, and have therefore rendered themselves liable to the punishment of death. Messrs. Blathers and Duff came back again, as wise as they went. In short, after some more examination, and a great deal more conversation, a neighbouring magistrate was readily induced to take the joint bail of Mrs. Maylie and Mr. Losburn for Oliver's appearance, if he should ever be called upon. And Blathers and Duff, being rewarded with a couple of guineas, returned to town with divided opinions on the subject of their expedition. The latter gentleman, on a mature consideration of all the circumstances, inclining to the belief that the burglarious attempt had originated with the family pet and the former being equally disposed to concede the full merit of it to the great Mr. Conky Chickweed. Meanwhile, Oliver gradually throve and prospered, under the united care of Mrs. Maylie, Rose, and the kind-hearted Mr. Losburn. If fervent prayers, gushing from hearts overcharged with gratitude, be heard in heaven, and if they be not what prayers are, the blessings which the orphan child called down upon them, sunk into their souls, 
diffusing peace and happiness. Chapter 32 Of the happy life Oliver began to lead with his kind friends. Oliver's ailings were neither slight nor few. In addition to the pain and delay attendant on a broken limb, his exposure to the wet and cold had brought on fever and ague, which hung about him for many weeks, and reduced him sadly. But at length he began by slow degrees to get better, and to be able to say sometimes, in a few tearful words, how deeply he felt the goodness of the two sweet ladies, and how ardently he hoped that when he grew strong and well again, he could do something to show his gratitude, only something which would let them see the love and duty with which his breast was full. Something, however slight, which would prove to them that their gentle kindness had not been cast away, but that the poor boy, whom their charity had rescued from misery or death, was eager to serve them with his whole heart and soul. "'Poor fellow,' said Rose, when Oliver had been, one day, feebly endeavouring to utter the words of thankfulness that rose to his pale lips. "'You shall have many opportunities of serving us, if you will. We are going into the country, and my aunt intends that you shall accompany us. The quiet place, the pure air, and all the pleasure of beauties of spring will restore you in a few days. We will employ you in a hundred ways, when you can bear the trouble.' "'The trouble!' cried Oliver. "'Oh, dear lady, if I could but work for you! If I could only give you pleasure by watering your flowers, or watching your birds, or running up and down the whole day long to make you happy, what would I give to do it? You shall give nothing at all, said Miss Maylie, smiling, for, as I told you before, we shall employ you in a hundred ways, and if you only take half the trouble to please us that you promise now, you will make me very happy indeed. "'Happy, ma'am?' cried Oliver. "'How kind of you to say so!' "'You will make me happier than I can tell you,' replied the young lady. "'To think that my dear good aunt should have been the means of rescuing any one from such sad misery as you have described to us would be an unspeakable pleasure to me. But to know that the object of her goodness and compassion was sincerely grateful and attached, in consequence, would delight me more than you can well imagine. Do you understand me?" she inquired, watching Oliver's thoughtful face. "'Oh, yes, ma'am, yes,' replied Oliver eagerly. "'But I was thinking that I am ungrateful now.' "'To whom?' inquired the young lady. To the kind gentleman, and the dear old nurse, who took so much care of me before," rejoined Oliver. "'If they knew how happy I am, they would be pleased, I am sure.' "'I am sure that they would,' rejoined Oliver's benefactress. "'And Mr. Losburn has already been kind enough to promise that when you are well enough to bear the journey, he will carry you to see them.' "'Has he, ma'am?' cried Oliver, his face brightening with pleasure. "'I don't know what I shall do for joy when I see their kind faces once again.' In a short time Oliver was sufficiently recovered to undergo the fatigue of this expedition. One morning he and Mr. Losburn set out, accordingly, in a little carriage which belonged to Mrs. Maylie. When they came to Chertsey Bridge, Oliver turned very pale, and uttered a loud exclamation. "'What's the matter with the boy?' cried the doctor, as usual, all in a bustle. "'Do you see anything, hear anything, feel anything, eh?' "'That, sir,' cried Oliver, pointing out of the carriage window, "'that house—' "'Yes, well, one of it. Stop, coachman, pull up here,' cried the doctor. "'What of the house, my man, eh?' "'The thieves, the house they took me to,' whispered Oliver. "'The devil it is!' cried the doctor. "'Hello there! Let me out!' But before the coachman could dismount from his box, he had tumbled out of the coach, by some means or other, and, running down to the deserted tenement, began kicking at the door like a madman. "'Hello!' said a little, ugly, hump-backed man, 
opening the door so suddenly that the doctor, from the very impetus of his last kick, nearly fell forward into the passage. "'What's the matter here?' "'Matter?' exclaimed the other, collaring him, without a moment's reflection. "'A good deal. Robbery is the matter.' "'There'll be murder the matter, too,' replied the humpback man coolly. "'If you don't take your hands off, do you hear me?' "'I hear you,' said the doctor, giving his captive a hearty shake. "'Where's—' "'Confound the fellow! What's his rascally name? Sykes! That's it! Where's Sykes, you thief?' The humpback man stared, as if in excess of amazement and indignation, then, twisting himself dexterously from the doctor's grasp, growled forth a volley of horrid oaths, and retired into the house. Before he could shut the door, however, the doctor had passed into the parlour without a word of parley. He looked anxiously round. Not an article of furniture, not a vestige of anything, animate or inanimate, not even the position of the cupboards, answered Oliver's description. "'Now,' said the humpback man, who had watched him keenly, "'What do you mean by coming into my house in this violent way? Do you want to rob me, or to murder me? Which is it?' "'Did you ever know a man come out to do either, in a chariot and pair, you ridiculous old vampire?' said the irritable doctor. "'What do you want, then?' demanded the hunchback. "'Will you take yourself off, before I do you a mischief? Curse you!' "'As soon as I think proper,' said Mr. Losburn, looking into the other parlour, which, like the first, bore no resemblance whatever to Oliver's account of it, "'I shall find you out some day, my friend.' "'Will you?' sneered the ill-favoured cripple. "'If you ever want me, I'm here. I haven't lived here mad and all alone for five and twenty years to be scared by you. You shall pay for this. You shall pay for this.' And so saying, the misshapen little demon set up a yell, and danced upon the ground as if wild with rage. "'Stupid enough, this,' muttered the doctor to himself. "'The boy must have made a mistake. Here, put that in your pocket, and shut yourself up again.' With these words he flung the hunchback a piece of money, and returned to the carriage. The man followed to the chariot door, uttering the wildest imprecations and curses all the way, but as Mr. Losburn turned to speak to the driver, he looked into the carriage, and eyed Oliver for an instant with a glance so sharp and fierce, and at the same time so furious and vindictive, that, waking or sleeping, he could not forget it for months afterwards. He continued to utter the most fearful imprecations until the driver had resumed his seat, and when they were once more on their way, they could see him some distance behind, beating his feet upon the ground, and tearing his hair in transports of real or pretended rage. "'I am an ass,' said the doctor, after a long silence. "'Did you know that before, Oliver?' "'No, sir.' "'Then don't forget it another time. An ass,' said the doctor again, after a further silence of some minutes. "'Even if it had been the right place, and the right fellows had been there, what could I have done, single-handed? And if I had had assistance, I see no good that I should have done.' except leading to my own exposure, and an unavoidable statement of the manner in which I have hushed up this business. That would have served me right, though. I am always involving myself in some scrape or other by acting on impulse. It might have done me good." Now, the fact was, that the excellent doctor had never acted upon anything but impulse all through his life, and it was no bad compliment to the nature of the impulse which governed him that so far from being involved in any peculiar troubles or misfortunes, he had the warmest respect and esteem of all who knew him. If the truth must be told, he was a little out of temper, for a minute or two at being disappointed in procuring corroborative evidence of Oliver's story on the very first occasion on which he had a chance of obtaining any. He soon came round again, however, and finding that Oliver's replies to his questions were still as straightforward and consistent, and still delivered with as much apparent sincerity and truth as it had ever been, he made up his mind to attach full credence to them from that time forth. As Oliver knew the name of the street in which Mr. Brownlow resided, they were enabled to drive straight thither. When the coach turned into it, his heart beat so violently that he could scarcely draw his breath. 
"'Now, my boy, which house is it?' inquired Mr. Losburn. "'That! That!' replied Oliver, pointing eagerly out of the window. "'The White House! Oh, make haste! Pray make haste! I, I feel as if I should die! It makes me tremble so!' "'Come, come!' said the good doctor, patting him on the shoulder. "'You will see them directly, and they will be overjoyed to find you safe and well.' "'Oh, I hope so!' cried Oliver. "'They were so good to me! So very, very good to me!' The coach rolled on. It stopped. No, that was the wrong house. The next door. It went on a few paces, and stopped again. Oliver looked up at the windows, with tears of happy expectation coursing down his face. Alas! The White House was empty, and there was a bill in the window to let. "'Knock at the next door,' cried Mr. Losburn, taking Oliver's arm in his. "'What has become of Mr. Brownlow, who used to live in the adjoining house, do you know?' The servant did not know, but would go and inquire. She presently returned, and said that Mr. Brownlow had sold off his goods, and gone to the West Indies six weeks before. Oliver clasped his hands, and sank feebly backward. "'Has his housekeeper gone too?' inquired Mr. Losburn, after a moment's pause. "'Yes, sir,' replied the servant. "'The old gentleman, the housekeeper, and a gentleman who was a friend of Mr. Brownlow's, all went together.' "'Then turn towards home again,' said Mr. Losburn to the driver, "'and don't stop to bait the horses till you get out of this confounded London.' "'The bookstall keeper, sir,' said Oliver. "'I know the way there. See him, pray, sir. Do see him.' "'My poor boy, this is disappointment enough for one day,' said the doctor. "'Quite enough for both of us. If we go to the bookstall keeper's, we shall certainly find that he is dead, or set his house on fire, or run away. No, home again straight.' And in obedience to the doctor's impulse, home they went. This bitter disappointment caused Oliver much sorrow and grief, even in the midst of his happiness, for he had pleased himself many times during his illness with thinking of all that Mr. Brownlow and Mrs. Bedwin would say to him, and what delight it would be to tell them how many long days and nights he had passed in reflecting on what they had done for him, and in bewailing his cruel separation from them. The hope of eventually clearing himself with them, too, and explaining how he had been forced away, had buoyed him up and sustained him under many of his recent trials. And now the idea that they should have gone so far, and carried with them the belief that he was an impostor and a robber, a belief which might remain uncontradicted to his dying day, was almost more than he could bear. The circumstance occasioned no alteration, however, in the behaviour of his benefactors. After another fortnight, when the fine warm weather had fairly begun, and every tree and flower was putting forth its young leaves and rich blossoms, they made preparations for quitting the house at Chertsey for some months. Sending the plate, which had so excited Fagin's cupidity, to the bankers, and leaving Giles and another servant in care of the house, they departed to a cottage at some distance in the country, and took Oliver with them. Who can describe the pleasure and delight, the peace of mind and soft tranquillity, the sickly boy felt in the balmy air, and among the green hills and rich woods of an inland village. Who can tell how scenes of peace and quietude sink into the minds of pain-worn dwellers in close and noisy places, and carry their own freshness deep into their jaded hearts? Men who have lived in crowded, pent-up streets through lives of toil, and who have never wished for change, men to whom custom has indeed been second nature, and who have come almost to love each brick and stone that formed the narrow boundaries of their daily walks, even they, with the hand of death upon them, have been known to yearn at last for one short glimpse of nature's face, and, carried far from the scenes of their old pains and pleasures, have seemed to pass at once into a new state of being. Crawling forth from day to day, to some green sunny spot, they have had such memories wakened up within them, by the sight of the sky, and hill, and plain, and glistening water, that a foretaste of heaven itself has soothed their quick decline, and they have sunk into their tombs as peacefully as the sun whose setting they watched from their lonely chamber window but a few hours before, faded from their dim and feeble sight. The memories which peaceful country scenes call up are not of this world, 
nor of its thoughts and hopes. Their gentle influence may teach us how to weave fresh garlands for the graves of those we loved, may purify our thoughts, and bear down before it old enmity and hatred. But beneath all this, there lingers, in the least reflective mind, a vague and half-formed consciousness of having held such feelings long before, in some remote and distant time, which calls up solemn thoughts of distant times to come, and bends down pride and worldliness beneath it. It was a lovely spot to which they repaired. Oliver, whose days had been spent among squalid crowds, and in the midst of noise and brawling, seemed to enter on a new existence there. The rose and honeysuckle clung to the cottage walls, the ivy crept round the trunks of the trees, and the garden flowers perfumed the air with delicious odours. Hard by was a little churchyard, not crowded with tall unsightly gravestones, but full of humble mounds, covered with fresh turf and moss, beneath which the old people of the village lay at rest. Oliver often wandered there, and, thinking of the wretched grave in which his mother lay, would sometimes sit him down and sob unseen. But when he raised his eyes to the deep sky overhead, he would cease to think of her as lying in the ground, and would weep for her, sadly but without pain. It was a happy time. The days were peaceful and serene, the nights brought with them neither fear nor care, no languishing in a wretched prison, or associating with wretched men, nothing but pleasant and happy thoughts. Every morning he went to a white-headed old gentleman, who lived near the little church, who taught him to read better, and to write, and who spoke so kindly, and took such pains, that Oliver could never try enough to please him. Then he would walk with Mrs. Maylie and Rose, and hear them talk of books, or perhaps sit near them in some shady place, and listen whilst the young lady read, which he could have done, until it grew too dark to see the letters. Then he had his own lesson for the next day to prepare, and at this he would work hard, in a little room which looked into the garden, till evening came slowly on, when the ladies would walk out again, and he with them, listening with such pleasure to all they said, and so happy if they wanted a flower that he could climb to reach, or had forgotten anything he could run to fetch, that he could never be quick enough about it. When it became quite dark, and they returned home, the young lady would sit down to the piano, and play some pleasant air, or sing, in a low and gentle voice, some old song which it pleased her aunt to hear. There would be no candles lighted at such times as these, and Oliver would sit by one of the windows, listening to the sweet music in a perfect rapture. And when Sunday came, how differently the day was spent, from any way in which he had ever spent it yet! And how happily, too, like all the other days in that most happy time! There was the little church in the morning, with the green leaves fluttering at the windows, the birds singing without, and the sweet-smelling air stealing in at the low porch, and filling the homely building with its fragrance. The poor people were so neat and clean, and knelt so reverently in prayer, that it seemed a pleasure, not a tedious duty, their assembling there together. And though the singing might be rude, it was real, and sounded more musical, to Oliver's ears at least, than any he had ever heard in church before. Then there were the walks, as usual, and many calls at the clean houses of the labouring men, and at night Oliver read a chapter or two from the Bible, which he had been studying all the week, and in the performance of which duty he felt more proud and pleased than if he had been the clergyman himself. In the morning Oliver would be afoot by six o'clock, roaming the fields and plundering the hedges far and wide for nosegays of wild flowers, with which he would return laden home and which it took great care and consideration to arrange, to the best advantage, for the embellishment of the breakfast-table. There was fresh groundsel too, for Miss Maylie's birds, with which Oliver, who had been studying the subject under the able tuition of the village clerk, would decorate the cages in the most approved taste. When the birds were made all spruce and smart for the day, there was usually some little commission of charity to execute in the village, or, failing that, there was rare cricket-playing, sometimes on the green, or failing that, there was always something to do in the garden, or about the plants, to which Oliver, who had studied this science also, under the same master, who was a gardener by trade, applied himself with hearty good will, until Miss Rose made her appearance, 
when there were a thousand commendations to be bestowed on all he had done. So three months glided away, three months which, in the life of the most blessed and favoured of mortals, might have been unmingled happiness, and which, in Oliver's, were true felicity. With the purest and most amiable generosity on one side, and the truest, warmest, soul-felt gratitude on the other, it is no wonder that, by the end of that short time, Oliver Twist had become completely domesticated with the old lady and her niece, and that the fervent attachment of his young and sensitive heart was repaid by their pride in an attachment to himself. CHAPTER Thirty Three, Wherein the happiness of Oliver and his friends experiences a sudden check. Spring flew swiftly by, and summer came. If the village had been beautiful at first, it was now in the full glow and luxuriance of its richness. The great trees, which had looked shrunken and bare in the early months, had now burst into strong life and health, and stretching forth their green arms over the thirsty ground, converted open and naked spots into choice nooks, where there was a deep and pleasant shade from which to look upon the wide prospect, steeped in sunshine, which lay stretched beyond. The earth had donned her mantle of brightest green, and shed her richest perfumes abroad. It was the prime and vigour of the year. All things were glad and flourishing. Still the same quiet life went on at the little cottage, and the same cheerful serenity prevailed among its inmates. Oliver had long since grown stout and healthy, but health or sickness made no difference in his warm feelings of a great many people. He was still the same gentle, attached, affectionate creature that he had been when pain and suffering had wasted his strength, and when he was dependent for every slight attention and comfort on those who tended him. One beautiful night, when they had taken a longer walk than was customary with them, for the day had been unusually warm, and there was a brilliant moon, and a light wind had sprung up which was unusually refreshing. Rose had been in high spirits, too and they had walked on in merry conversation, until they had far exceeded their ordinary bounds. Mrs. Maylie, being fatigued, they returned more slowly home. The young lady, merely throwing off her simple bonnet, sat down to the piano as usual. After running abstractedly over the keys for a few minutes, she fell into a low and very solemn air, and as she played it, they heard a sound, as if she were weeping. "'Rose, my dear!' said the elderly lady. Rose made no reply, but played a little quicker, as though the words had roused her from some painful thoughts. "'Rose, my love!' cried Mrs. Maylie, rising hastily and bending over her. "'What is this? In tears? My dear child, what distresses you?' "'Nothing, aunt, nothing,' replied the young lady. "'I don't know what it is. I can't describe it, but I feel—' "'Not ill, my love?' interposed Mrs. Maylie. "'No, no, uh, oh, not ill,' replied Rose, shuddering as though some deadly chillness were passing over her while she spoke. "'I shall be better presently. Close the window, pray.' Oliver hastened to comply with her request. The young lady, making an effort to recover her cheerfulness, strove to play some livelier tune but her fingers dropped powerless over the keys. Covering her face with her hands, she sank upon a sofa, and gave vent to the tears which she was now unable to repress. "'My child,' said the elderly lady, folding her arms about her, "'I never saw you so before. "'I would not alarm you if I could avoid it,' rejoined Rose. "'But, indeed, I have tried very hard, and cannot help this— I fear I am ill, aunt." She was, indeed, for when the candles were brought, they saw that in the very short time which had elapsed since their return home, the hue of her countenance had changed to a marble whiteness. Its expression had lost nothing of its beauty, but it was changed, and there was an anxious, haggard look about the gentle face, which it had never worn before. Another minute, and it was suffused with a crimson flush and a heavy wildness came over the soft blue eye. Again this disappeared, like the shadow thrown by a passing cloud, and she was once more deadly pale. 
Oliver, who watched the old lady anxiously, observed that she was alarmed by these appearances, and so in truth was he. But seeing that she affected to make light of them, he endeavoured to do the same, and they so far succeeded that when Rose was persuaded by her aunt to retire for the night, she was in better spirits, and appeared even in better health, assuring them that she felt certain she would rise in the morning quite well. "'I hope,' said Oliver, when Mrs. Maylie returned, "'that nothing is the matter. She don't look well to-night, but—' The old lady motioned to him not to speak, and sitting herself down in a dark corner of the room, remained silent for some time. At length she said, in a trembling voice, "'I hope not, Oliver. I have been very happy with her for some years. Too happy, perhaps. It may be time that I should meet with some misfortune, but I hope it is not this.' "'What?' inquired Oliver. "'The heavy blow.' said the old lady, of losing the dear girl who has so long been my comfort and happiness. "'Oh, God forbid!' exclaimed Oliver hastily. "'Amen to that, my child,' said the old lady, wringing her hands. "'Surely there is no danger of anything so dreadful,' said Oliver. Two hours ago she was quite well.' "'She is very ill now.' rejoined Mrs. Maylie, and will be worse, I am sure. My dear, dear Rose, oh, what shall I do without her?" She gave way to such great grief that Oliver, suppressing his own emotion, ventured to remonstrate with her, and to beg earnestly that, for the sake of the dear young lady herself, she would be more calm. "'And consider, ma'am,' said Oliver as the tears forced themselves into his eyes, despite all of his efforts to the contrary. "'Oh, consider how young and good she is, and what pleasure and comfort she gives to all about her. I am sure, certain, quite certain, that for your sake, who are so good yourself, and for her own, and for the sake of all she makes so happy, she will not die. Heaven will never let her die so young.' "'Hush!' said Mrs. Maylie, laying her hand on Oliver's head. "'You think like a child, poor boy. But you teach me my duty notwithstanding. I had forgotten it for a moment, Oliver. But I hope I may be pardoned, for I am old, and have seen enough of illness and death to know the agony of separation from the objects of our love. I have seen enough, too, to know that it is not always the youngest and best who are spared to those that love them. But this should give us comfort in our sorrow, for heaven is just. And such things teach us, impressively, that there is a brighter world than this, and that the passage to it is speedy. God's will be done. I love her, and he knows how well. Oliver was surprised to see that, as Mrs. Maylie said these words, she checked her lamentations as though by one effort, and, drawing herself up as she spoke, became composed and firm. He was still more astonished to find that this firmness lasted, and that, under all the care and watching which ensued, Mrs. Maylie was ever ready and collected, performing all the duties which had devolved upon her, steadily, and, to all external appearances, even cheerfully. But he was young, and did not know what strong minds are capable of under trying circumstances. How should he, when their possessors so seldom know themselves? An anxious night ensued. When morning came, Mrs. Maylie's predictions were but too well verified. Rose was in the first stage of a high and dangerous fever. "'We must be active, Oliver, and not give way to useless grief,' said Mrs. Maylie laying her finger on her lip, as she looked steadily into his face. "'This letter must be sent, with all possible expedition, to Mr. Losburn. It must be carried to the market-town, which is not more than four miles off, by the footpath across the field, and thence dispatched by an express on horseback straight to Chertsey. The people at the inn will undertake to do this, and I can trust to you to see it done, I know.' 
Oliver could make no reply, but looked his anxiety to be gone at once. "'Here is another letter,' said Mrs. Maylie, pausing to reflect. "'But whether to send it now, or wait until I see how Rose goes on, I scarcely know. I would not forward it unless I feared the worst.' "'Is it for Chertsey too, ma'am?' inquired Oliver, impatient to execute his commission, and holding out his trembling hand for the letter. "'No,' replied the old lady, giving it to him mechanically. Oliver glanced at it, and saw that it was directed to Harry Maylie, Esquire, at some great lord's house in the country, where he could not make out. "'Shall it go, ma'am?' asked Oliver, looking up impatiently. "'I think not,' replied Mrs. Maylie, taking it back. "'I will wait until to-morrow.' With these words she gave Oliver her purse, and he started off, without more delay, at the greatest speed he could muster. Swiftly he ran across the fields, and down the little lanes which sometimes divided them, now almost hidden by the high corn on either side, and now emerging on an open field, where the mowers and haymakers were busy at their work. Nor did he stop once, save now and then, for a few seconds, to recover breath, until he came in a great heat and covered with dust on the little market-place of the market-town. Here he paused, and looked about for the inn. There were a white bank, a red brewery, and a yellow town hall, and in one corner there was a large house, with all the wood about it painted green, before which was the sign of the George. To this he hastened as soon as it caught his eye. He spoke to a postboy who was dozing under the gateway, and who, after hearing what he wanted, referred him to the ostler, who, after hearing all he had to say again, referred him to the landlord, who was a tall gentleman in a blue neckcloth, a white hat, drab breeches, and boots with tops to match, leaning against a pump by the stable door, picking his teeth with a silver toothpick. This gentleman walked with much deliberation into the bar, to make out the bill, which took a long time making out, and after it was ready, and paid, a horse had to be saddled, and a man to be dressed, which took up ten good minutes more. Meanwhile, Oliver was in such a desperate state of impatience and anxiety, that he felt as if he could have jumped upon the horse himself, and galloped away, full tear, to the next stage. At length all was ready, and the little parcel having been handed up, with many injunctions and entreaties for its speedy delivery, the man set spurs to his horse, and rattling over the uneven paving of the market-place, was out of the town, and galloping along the turnpike road in a couple of minutes. As it was something to feel certain that assistance was sent for, and that no time had been lost, Oliver hurried up the inn-yard with a somewhat lighter heart. He was turning out of the gateway, when he accidentally stumbled against a tall man, wrapped in a cloak, who was at that moment coming out of the inn-door. "'Ha!' cried the man, fixing his eyes on Oliver, and suddenly recoiling. "'What the devil's this?' "'I beg your pardon, sir.' said Oliver. I was in a great hurry to get home, and didn't see you were coming." "'Death!' muttered the man to himself, glaring at the boy with his large dark eyes. "'Who would have thought it? Grind him no ashes! He'd start up from a stone coffin to come in my way!' "'I'm sorry,' stammered Oliver, confused by the strange man's wild look. "'I hope I have not hurt you.' "'Rot you!' murmured the man in a horrible passion between his clenched teeth, if I had only had the courage to say the word, I might have been free of you in a night. Curses on your head, and black death on your heart, you imp! What are you doing here?" The man shook his fist, as he uttered these words incoherently. He advanced towards Oliver, as if with the intention of aiming a blow at him, but fell violently on the ground, writhing and foaming in a fit. Oliver gazed for a moment at the struggles of the madman, for such he supposed him to be and then darted into the house for help. Having seen him safely carried into the hotel, he turned his face homewards, running as fast as he could, to make up for lost time, and recalling with a great deal of astonishment and some fear the extraordinary behaviour of the person from whom he had just parted. The circumstance did not dwell in his recollection long, however, for when he reached the cottage there was enough to occupy his mind, and to drive all considerations of self completely from his memory. Rose Maylie had rapidly grown worse, 
before midnight she was delirious. A medical practitioner, who resided on the spot, was in constant attendance upon her, and after first seeing the patient, he had taken Mrs. Maylie aside, and pronounced her disorder to be one of a most alarming nature. "'In fact,' he said, "'it would be little short of a miracle if she recovered.' How often did Oliver start from his bed that night, and stealing out, with noiseless footsteps, to the staircase, listen for the slightest sound from the sick chamber! How often did a tremble shake his frame, and cold drops of terror start upon his brow, when a sudden trampling of feet caused him to fear that something too dreadful to think of had even then occurred! And what had been the fervency of all the prayers he had ever muttered, compared with those he poured forth now, in the agony and passion of his supplication for the life and health of the gentle creature who was tottering on the deep grave's verge. Oh, the suspense, the fearful, acute suspense, of standing idly by, while the life of one we dearly love is trembling in the balance! Oh, the racking thoughts that crowd upon the mind, and make the heart beat violently, and the breath come thick by the force of the images they conjure up before it! the desperate anxiety to be doing something to relieve the pain or lessen the danger which we have no power to alleviate, the sinking of soul and spirit which the sad remembrance of our helplessness produces. What tortures can equal these? What reflections or endeavours can, in the full tide and fever of the time, allay them? Morning came, and the little cottage was lonely and still. People spoke in whispers. Anxious faces appeared at the gate from time to time. Women and children went away in tears. All the live-long day, and for hours after it had grown dark, Oliver paced softly up and down the garden, raising his eyes every instant to the sick chamber, and shuddering to see the darkened window, looking as if death lay stretched inside. Late that night Mr. Losburn arrived. "'It is hard,' said the good doctor, turning away as he spoke, "'so young, so much beloved, but there is very little hope." Another morning. The sun shone brightly, as brightly as if it looked upon no misery or care, and with every leaf and flower in full bloom about her, with life and health and sounds and sights of joy surrounding her on every side, the fair young creature lay, wasting fast. Oliver crept away to the old churchyard, and sitting down on one of the green mounds, wept and prayed for her in silence. There was such peace and beauty in the scene, so much of brightness and mirth in the sunny landscape, such blithesome music in the songs of the summer birds, such freedom in the rapid flight of the rook, careering overhead, so much of life and joyousness in all, that, when the boy raised his aching eyes, and looked about, the thought instinctively occurred to him that this was not a time for death that Rose could surely never die, when humbler things were all so glad and gay, that graves were for cold and cheerless winter, not for sunlight and fragrance. He almost thought that shrouds were for the old and shrunken, and they never wrapped the young and graceful form in their ghastly folds. A knell from the church bell broke harshly on these youthful thoughts. Another. Again. It was tolling for the funeral service. A group of humble mourners entered the gate, wearing white favours, for the corpse was young. They stood uncovered by a grave, and there was a mother, a mother once, among the weeping train. But the sun shone brightly, and the birds sang on. Oliver turned homeward, thinking on the many kindnesses he had received from the young lady, and wishing that the time could come again, that he might never cease showing her how grateful and attached he was. He had no cause for self-reproach on the score of neglect, or want of thought, for he had been devoted to her service, and yet a hundred little occasions rose up before him, on which he fancied he might have been more zealous, and more earnest, and wished he had been. We need be careful how we deal with those about us, when every death carries, to some small circle of survivors, thoughts of so much omitted, and so little done, of so many things forgotten, and so many more which might have been repaired. There is no remorse so deep as that which is unavailing. If we would be spared its tortures, let us remember this in time." When he reached home, Mrs. Maylie was sitting in the little parlour. Oliver's heart sank at sight of her, 
for she had never left the bedside of her niece, and he trembled to think what change could have driven her away. He learnt that she had fallen into a deep sleep, from which she would waken either to recovery and life, or to bid them farewell and die. They sat, listening, and afraid to speak, for hours. The untasted meal was removed, with looks which showed that their thoughts were elsewhere. They watched the sun as he sank lower and lower, and, at length, cast over sky and earth those brilliant hues which herald his departure. Their quick ears caught the sound of an approaching footstep. They both involuntarily darted to the door, as Mr. Losburn entered. "'What of Rose?' cried the old lady. "'Tell me at once. I can bear it. Anything but suspense. Oh, tell me, in the name of heaven!' "'You must compose yourself,' said the doctor, supporting her. "'Be calm. My dear ma'am, pray.' "'Let me go, in God's name. My dear child, she is dead. She is dying.' "'No,' cried the doctor, passionately. "'As he is good and merciful, she will live to bless us all for years to come.' The lady fell upon her knees, and tried to fold her hands together but the energy which had supported her so long fled up to heaven with her first thanksgiving, and she sank into the friendly arms which were extended to receive her. CHAPTER Thirty Four Contains some introductory particulars relative to a young gentleman who now arrives upon the scene, and a new adventure which happened to Oliver. It was almost too much happiness to bear. Oliver felt stunned and stupefied by the unexpected intelligence. He could not weep, or speak, or rest. He had scarcely the power of understanding anything that had passed, until, after a long ramble in the quiet evening air, a burst of tears came to his relief, and he seemed to awaken all at once to a full sense of the joyful change that had occurred, and the almost insupportable load of anguish which had been taken from his breast. The night was fast closing in when he returned homeward, laden with flowers which he had culled with peculiar care for the adornment of the sick chamber. As he walked briskly along the road, he heard behind him the noise of some vehicle approaching at a furious pace. Looking round, he saw that it was a post-chaise, driven at great speed, and as the horses were galloping and the road was narrow, he stood leaning against the gate until it should have passed him. As it dashed on, Oliver caught a glimpse of a man in a white nightcap, whose face seemed familiar to him, although his view was so brief that he could not identify the person. In another second or two the nightcap was thrust out of the chaise window, and a stentorian voice bellowed to the driver to stop, which he did as soon as he could pull up his horses. Then the nightcap once again appeared, and the same voice called Oliver by his name. "'Here!' cried the voice. "'Oliver! "'What's the news? "'Miss Rose? "'Master Oliver?' "'It is you, Giles,' cried Oliver, running up to the chaise door. Giles popped out his nightcap again, preparatory to making some reply, when he was suddenly pulled back by a young gentleman who occupied the other corner of the chaise, and who eagerly demanded what was the news. "'In a word,' cried the gentleman, "'better or worse?' "'Better!' "'Much better,' replied Oliver hastily. "'Thank heaven!' exclaimed the gentleman. "'You are sure?' "'Quite, sir,' replied Oliver. "'The change took place only a few hours ago, and Mr. Losburn says that all danger is at an end.' The gentleman said not another word, but, opening the chaise door, leapt out, and, taking Oliver hurriedly by the arm, led him aside. "'You are quite certain.' "'There is no possibility of any mistake on your part, my boy, is there?' demanded the gentleman, in a tremulous voice. "'Do not deceive me by awakening hopes that are not to be fulfilled.' "'I would not for the world, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Indeed, you may believe me. Mr. Losburn's words were that she would live to bless us all for many years to come. I heard him say so.' The tears stood in Oliver's eyes as he recalled the scene which was the beginning of so much happiness, and the gentleman turned his face away, and remained silent for some minutes. Oliver thought he heard him sob, more than once, 
but he feared to interrupt him by any fresh remark, for he could well guess what his feelings were, and so stood apart, feigning to be occupied with his nosegay. All this time, Mr. Giles, with the white nightcap on, had been sitting on the steps of the chaise, supporting an elbow on each knee, and wiping his eyes with a blue cotton pocket-handkerchief, dotted with white spots. That the honest fellow had not been feigning emotion, was abundantly demonstrated by the very red eyes with which he regarded the young gentleman. Then he turned round and addressed him. "'I think you had better go on to my mother's in the chaise, Giles,' said he. "'I would rather walk slowly on, so as to gain a little time before I see her. You can say I am coming.' "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Harry,' said Giles, giving a final polish to his ruffled countenance with the handkerchief. "'But if you would leave the postboy to say that, I should be very much obliged to you. It wouldn't be proper for the maids to see me in this state, sir. I should never have any more authority with them if they did.' "'Well,' rejoined Harry Maylie, smiling, "'you can do as you like. Let him go on with the luggage, if you wish, and do you follow with us. Only first exchange that nightcap for some more appropriate covering, or we shall be taken for madmen.' Mr. Giles, reminded of his unbecoming costume, snatched off and pocketed his nightcap, and substituted a hat of grave and sober shape, which he took out of the chaise. This done, the postboy drove off. Giles, Mr. Maylie, and Oliver followed at their leisure. As they walked along, Oliver glanced from time to time with much interest and curiosity at the newcomer. He seemed about five and twenty years of age, and was of the middle height, his countenance was frank and handsome, and his demeanour easy and prepossessing. Notwithstanding the difference between youth and age, he bore so strong a likeness to the old lady, that Oliver would have had no great difficulty in imagining their relationship, if he had not already spoken of her as his mother. Mrs. Maylie was anxiously waiting to receive her son when he reached the cottage. The meeting did not take place without great emotion on both sides. "'Mother!' whispered the young man. "'Why did you not write before?' "'I did,' replied Mrs. Maylie. "'But on reflection I determined to keep back the letter until I had heard Mr. Losburn's opinion.' "'But why?' said the young man. "'Why run the chance of that occurring, which so nearly happened? If Rose had—I cannot utter that word now. If this illness had terminated differently, how could you ever have forgiven yourself?' How could I ever have known happiness again?" "'If that had been the case, Harry,' said Mrs. Maylie, "'I fear your happiness would have been effectually blighted, and that your arrival here, a day sooner or a day later, would have been of very, very little import.' "'And who can wonder if it be so, mother?' rejoined the young man. "'Or why should I say, if it, it, it is—' It is, oh, you know it, mother, you must know it. I know that she deserves the best and purest love the heart of man can offer, said Mrs. Maylie. I know that the devotion and affection of her nature require no ordinary return, but one that shall be deep and lasting. If I did not feel this, and know, besides, that a changed behaviour in ones she loved would break her heart, I should not feel my task so difficult of performance, or have to encounter so many struggles in my own bosom, when I take what seems to me to be the strict line of duty." "'This is unkind, mother,' said Harry. "'Do you still suppose that I am a boy, ignorant of my own mind, and mistaking the impulses of my own soul?' "'I think, my dear son,' returned Mrs. Maylie, laying her hand upon his shoulder, that youth has many generous impulses which do not last, and that among them are some which, being gratified, become only the more fleeting. Above all, I think," said the lady, fixing her eyes on her son's face, that if an enthusiastic, ardent, and ambitious man marry a wife on whose name there is a stain, which, though it originate in no fault of hers, may be visited by cold and sordid people upon her, and upon his children also, and, in exact proportion to his success in the world, be cast in his teeth, 
and made the subject of sneers against him, he may, no matter how generous and good his nature, one day repent of the connection he formed in early life, and she may have the pain of knowing that he does so. Mother, said the young man impatiently, he would be a selfish brute, unworthy alike of the name of man and of the woman you describe who acted thus. You think so now, Harry, replied his mother, and ever will, said the young man. The mental agony I have suffered during the last two days wrings from me the avowal to you of a passion which, as you well know, is not one of yesterday, nor one I have lightly formed. On Rose, sweet, gentle girl, my heart is set as firmly as ever heart of man was set on woman. I have no thought, no view, no hope in life beyond her. And if you oppose me in this great stake, you take my peace and happiness in your hands, and cast them to the wind. Mother, think better of this, and of me, and do not disregard the happiness of which you seem to think so little. Harry, said Mrs. Maylie, it is because I think so much of warm and sensitive hearts, that I would spare them from being wounded. But we have said enough, and more than enough on this matter just now. Let it rest with Rose, then, interposed Harry. You will not press these overstrained opinions of yours so far as to throw any obstacle in my way. I will not, rejoined Mrs. Maylie, but I would have you consider. I have considered, was the impatient reply. Mother, I have considered years and years. I have considered ever since I have been capable of serious reflection. My feelings remain unchanged as they ever will. And why should I suffer the pain of a delay in giving them vent, which can be productive of no earthly good? No. Before I leave this place, Rose shall hear me." "'She shall,' said Mrs. Maylie. "'There is something in your manner which would almost imply that she will hear me coldly, mother,' said the young man. "'Not coldly,' rejoined the old lady. "'Far from it.' "'How, then?' urged the young man. She has formed no other attachment. No, indeed, replied his mother. You have, or I mistake, too strong a hold on her affections already. What I would say, resumed the old lady, stopping her son as he was about to speak, is this. Before you stake your all on this chance, before you suffer yourself to be carried to the highest point of hope, reflect for a few moments, my dear child, on Rose's history, and consider what effect the knowledge of her doubtful birth may have on her decision. Devoted as she is to us, with all the intensity of her noble mind, and with that perfect sacrifice of self which in all matters, great or trifling, has always been her characteristic. What do you mean? That I leave you to discover, replied Mrs. Maylie. I must go back to her. God bless you. I shall see you again to-night," said the young man eagerly. By and by, replied the lady, when I leave Rose. You will tell her I am here, said Harry. Of course, replied Mrs. Maylie, and say how anxious I have been, and how much I have suffered, and how I long to see her. You will not refuse to do this, mother? No said the old lady, I will tell her all. And pressing her son's hand affectionately, she hastened from the room. Mr. Losburn and Oliver had remained at another end of the apartment, while this hurried conversation was proceeding. The former now held out his hand to Harry Maylie, and hearty salutations were exchanged between them. The doctor then communicated, in reply to multifarious questions from his young friend, a precise account of his patient's situation which was quite as consolatory and full of promise, as Oliver's statement had encouraged him to hope, and to the whole of which Mr. Giles, who affected to be busy about the luggage, listened with greedy ears. "'Have you shot anything particular lately, Giles?' inquired the doctor when he had concluded. "'Nothing particular, sir,' replied Mr. Giles, colouring up to the eyes. "'Nor catching any thieves, nor identifying any housebreakers,' said the doctor. "'None at all, sir,' replied Mr. Giles, with much gravity. 
Well, said the doctor, I am sorry to hear it, because you do that sort of thing admirably. Pray, how is Brittles? The, the boy is very well, sir, said Mr. Giles, recovering his usual tone of patronage, and sends his respectful duty, sir. That's well, said the doctor. Seeing you here reminds me, Mr. Giles, that on the day before that on which I was called away so hurriedly, I executed, at the request of your good mistress, a small commission in your favour. Just step into this corner a moment, will you?" Mr. Giles walked into the corner with much importance and some wonder, and was honoured with a short whispering conference with the doctor, on the termination of which he made a great many bows, and retired with steps of unusual stateliness. The subject matter of this conference was not disclosed in the parlour, but the kitchen was speedily enlightened concerning it, for Mr. Giles walked straight thither, and having called for a mug of ale, announced with an air of majesty, which was highly effective, that it had pleased his mistress, in consideration of his gallant behaviour on the occasion of that attempted robbery, to deposit, in the local savings-bank, the sum of five and twenty pounds for his sole use and benefit. At this the two women-servants lifted up their hands and eyes, and supposed that Mr. Giles, pulling out his shirt-frill, replied, "'No, no!' and that if they observed that he was at all haughty to his inferiors, he would thank them to tell him so. And then he made a great many other remarks, no less illustrative of his humility, which were received with equal favour and applause, and were withal as original and as much to the purpose as the remarks of great men commonly are. Above the stairs, the remainder of the evening passed cheerfully away, for the doctor was in high spirits, and however fatigued or thoughtful Harry Maylie might have been at first, he was not proof against the worthy gentleman's good humour, which displayed itself in a great variety of sallies and professional recollections, and an abundance of small jokes, which struck Oliver as being the drollest things he had ever heard, and caused him to laugh proportionately, to the evident satisfaction of the doctor, who laughed immoderately at himself, and made Harry laugh almost as heartily by the very force of sympathy. So, they were as pleasant a party as, under the circumstances, they could well have been, and it was late before they retired, with light and thankful hearts, to take that rest of which, after the doubt and suspense they had recently undergone, they stood much in need. Oliver rose next morning in better heart, and went about his usual occupations with more hope and pleasure than he had known for many days. The birds were once more hung out, to sing in their old places, and the sweetest wild flowers that could be found were once more gathered to gladden Rose with their beauty. The melancholy, which had seemed to the sad eyes of the anxious boy to hang for days past over every object, beautiful as all were, was dispelled by magic. The dew seemed to sparkle more brightly on the green leaves, the air to rustle among them with a sweeter music, and the sky itself to look more blue and bright. Such is the influence which the condition of our own thoughts exercise even over the appearance of external objects. Men who look on nature and their fellow-men, and cry that all is dark and gloomy, are in the right, but the sombre colours are reflections from their own jaundiced eyes and hearts. The real hues are delicate, and need a clearer vision. It is worthy of remark, and Oliver did not fail to note it at the time, that his morning expeditions were no longer made alone. Harry Maylie, after the very first morning when he met Oliver, coming laden home, was seized with such a passion for flowers, and displayed such a taste in their arrangement, as left his young companion far behind. If Oliver were behindhand in these respects, he knew where the best were to be found, and morning after morning they scoured the country together, and brought home the fairest that blossomed. The window of the young lady's chamber was open now, for she loved to feel the rich summer air stream in, and revive her with its freshness. But they always stood in water, just inside the lattice, one particular little bunch which was made up with great care every morning. Oliver could not help noticing that the withered flowers were never thrown away, although the little vase was regularly replenished. Nor could he help observing that whenever the doctor came into the garden, he invariably cast his eyes up to that particular corner, and nodded his head most expressively as he set forth on his morning's walk. Pending these observations, the days were flying by, 
and Rose was rapidly recovering. Nor did Oliver's time hang heavy on his hands. Although the young lady had not yet left her chamber, and there were no evening walks, save now and then for a short distance with Mrs. Maylie, he applied himself, with redoubled assiduity, to the instructions of the white-headed old gentleman, and laboured so hard that his quick progress surprised even himself. It was while he was engaged in this pursuit that he was greatly startled and distressed by a most unexpected occurrence. The little room in which he was accustomed to sit, when busy at his books, was on the ground floor at the back of the house. It was quite a cottage room, with a lattice window, around which were clusters of jessamine and honeysuckle that crept over the casement and filled the place with their delicious perfume. It looked into a garden, whence a wicket gate opened into a small paddock. All beyond was fine meadow-land and wood. There was no other dwelling near, in that direction, and the prospect it commanded was very extensive. One beautiful evening, when the first shades of twilight were beginning to settle upon the earth, Oliver sat at this window, intent upon his books. He had been poring over them for some time, and as the day had been uncommonly sultry, and he had exerted himself a great deal, it is no disparagement to the authors, whoever they may have been, to say that gradually, and by slow degrees, he fell asleep. There is a kind of sleep that steals upon us sometimes, which, while it holds the body prisoner, does not free the mind from a sense of things about it, and enable it to ramble at its pleasure. So far as an overpowering heaviness, a prostration of strength, and an utter inability to control our thoughts or power of motion, can be called sleep, this is it. And yet, we have a consciousness of all that is going on about us. And, if we dream at such a time, words which are really spoken, or sounds which really exist at the moment, accommodate themselves with surprising readiness to our visions, until reality and imagination become so strangely blended that it is afterwards almost matter of impossibility to separate the two. Nor is this the most striking phenomenon incidental to such a state. It is an undoubted fact that although our senses of touch and sight be for the time dead, yet our sleeping thoughts and the visionary scenes that pass before us will be influenced and materially influenced by the mere silent presence of some external object which may not have been near us when we close our eyes, and of whose vicinity we have had no waking consciousness. Oliver knew perfectly well that he was in his own little room, that his books were lying on the table before him, that the sweet air was stirring among the creeping plants outside, and yet he was asleep. Suddenly the scene changed the air became close and confined, and he thought, with a glow of terror, that he was in the Jew's house again. There sat the hideous old man, in his accustomed corner, pointing at him, and whispering to another man, with his face averted, who sat beside him. "'Hush, my dear,' he thought he heard the Jew say, "'it is he, sure enough. Come away.' "'He?' the other man seemed to answer. Could I mistake him, think you? If a crowd of ghosts have put themselves into his exact shape, and he stood amongst them, there is something that would tell me how to point him out. If you buried him fifty feet deep, and took me across his grave, I fancy I should know, if there wasn't a mark above it that he lay buried there." The man seemed to say this with such dreadful hatred, that Oliver awoke with the fear, and started up. Good heaven! What was that which sent the blood tingling to his heart? and deprived him of his voice and of power to move. There, there, at the window, close before him, so close that he could have almost touched him before he started back, with his eyes peering into the room and meeting his. There stood the Jew, and beside him, white with rage or fear or both, were the scowling features of the man who had accosted him in the inn-yard. It was but an instant, a glance, a flash, before his eyes, and they were gone but they had recognised him, and he them, and their look was as firmly impressed upon his memory, as if it had been deeply carved in stone, and set before him from his birth. He stood transfixed for a moment, then, leaping from the window into the garden, called loudly for help. 